welcome everyone to Women in Big Data luncheon and panel and the um, um, Data Work Summit in Barcelona. And I'm very, very excited to be moderated today. This is my first time, but this panel is going to make me look good. And you will see why I'm very excited after um, this uh, professional women will introduce themselves. You understand why. So in the next 30, uh, 60 minutes or so, uh, we will hear from five accomplished technology professionals who also happen to be women. Um, and we want to hear on their thoughts on most exciting trends in our industry. We want to hear the projects that they're working on. We want to hear how the landscape of big data is changing, what will stay today and tomorrow, and what will fizzle out. We want to hear their, th their thoughts on what kind of skills professionals in our industry will need to be successful. So the theme for today's meeting is top technology trends women and men business leaders need to know about. And um, I think it's hugely relevant for all of us today, regardless of our gender. A um, little bit of a housekeeping. We'll have this panel and Q&A that I have, a, I have a list of questions that I'd like to ask. And we'll keep this panel open until 1.30. And then I'll open it up to, to the audience to ask questions. We'll have 15 minutes for that. And hopefully, we'll have 15 extra minutes for networking and wrap up. And I want to promote our freshly minted t-shirts that we ordered for this lunch. And we have extras that you can grab for yourself or for women in your life, for your daughters. And uh, of course, we'll have a gift for our panelists. So my name is Aksana Walton. I've been in technology for about 10 plus years, selling, marketing, and educating, enabling internal and external audiences about big data and enterprise technologies. My background is um, in aerospace engineering, and um, I've been working for years before I got into this on uh, regenerative um, life support system. So it sounds a little highfalutin, but in reality, it means building space toilets for the space stations. It's all about water regeneration. <laughs> That's in my past life. Again, I've been with Cloudera and uh, previously with Hortonworks for about three years. Last week was marked my third year anniversary. So with that, I'm super excited to introduce our panelists. And instead of reading their bios that they provided for, uh, for us, I'm going to just have them come up and introduce themselves. So first, we have Tina Rosario. Tina is a head mm -hmm, of data innovation and chief data officer at SAP. And she's also a president of Women in Big Data EMEA chapter. Tina? Hi. No, we didn't do anything. Try this. OK. Better? Mm -mm. Can we have the handheld, handhelds on? They're not working. You want to share? share? <laughs> we can be close. OK, give us a second, yeah. I can promise. OK. I'll stand right here. OK. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to Cloudera for hosting lunch today on this important topic of trends in big data, but particularly for getting a, such a strong group of women together for the panel. And I hope that you enjoy this afternoon with us. Um, as Oksana mentioned, I'm with SAP. I'm the head of data innovation, the chief data officer for SAP. And what that means is internally within SAP, we've had for the past 10 years a data management organization where we have invested in creating a set of capabilities internal to SAP, and that's the team that I run. It's about 100 or so strong, and we are responsible for everything from data quality and data operations to data science and data analytics at SAP. I've been there 19 years, which is pretty long in our industry, right? Um, and before that, I was with McKinsey for almost 10 years. I'm an American. I live in Paris. And I came to Europe four years ago. And when I did that, 
SAP asked me to be the president of the Women in Big Data chapter here across Europe. Women in Big Data started in 2015 in Silicon Valley as a partnership initiative across many data-specific high-tech companies like SAP, IBM, Intel, Cloudera, uh, Vodafone, Databricks, LinkedIn, Amazon Web Services, so many various companies got together with the idea that with the strength in numbers, we can make a difference in addressing the diversity gap within big data. And why big data? Why not just women in tech? I know there are lots of organizations that focus on that. We all felt that with big data comes big opportunities, opportunities specifically for women to excel. So we have various resources and uh, services available to people who are interested in big data. If you go to our website, go to our LinkedIn page, our Facebook page, we're all over social media, thanks to the power of the uh, companies that sponsor us. We're nonprofit, so events like this are really helpful for us to spread the word. I'm also gonna give a little plug for the, how many here are in Spain or in uh, Barcelona? A few. So we are looking to create a chapter here in Spain. We have 12 chapters across Europe, so we're really active in Germany, in Russia, in uh, South Africa even, in uh, Israel, in France, in the UK, but not yet in Spain. So I'd love to have some folks who are interested in creating their own Women in Big Data chapter here, that would be fabulous. That's a real added value for this panel if you guys can connect and continue the, the, yeah. the work that Tina is doing. And I wanted to mention something. Tina has moderated a panel like this for three or four times. So she gets to sit on the hot seat today. <laughs> Thank you, Tina. Okay, next I'll introduce Devon, Edward Jones, who is a data engineer with Lloyd's Banking Group. And Devon is the youngest probably member of our panel, but she's been creating quite a wave in the industry and UK. Thank you. Quite, quite an introduction there. Um, yeah, so my name's Devon. I'm a data engineer at Lloyd's Banking Group. And I think one of the things I, I bring to the panel is that I don't have that kind of traditional background in technology. Um, I actually studied anthropology at university, so I spent a lot of time looking at skeletons and things like that. So very, very different to now be working in big data. Um, so I'm very interested in, and a lot of the kind of voluntary work that I do outside of work is about helping people transition into big data, kind of understanding the landscape and what kind of skills you have to build up and everything like this. So yes, thank, thank you for having me. And I'm very excited to kind of talk about that as we go through the panel. Thank you. So next, next we have Violetta Cyril, and Violetta is very seasoned technology professional. She has PhD in economics. She wrote multiple books. I'm really pleased to have her on the panel today. Thank you very much. It seems that it does not work. Okay, so thank you very much for this invitation. I work now for AXA Group, uh, perhaps most of you know, you are clients of AXA maybe, for insurance company, it's uh, one of the largest uh, at the global level, it's French based, and uh, my current job is uh, to work on uh, in the division of so-called international and new markets, which uh, represents a group of countries uh, with a high growth potential from all over the continents. So from Latin America, Africa, Gulf, uh, Central and Eastern Europe, and some uh, several Asian countries. And uh, I uh, help uh, the business to turn around when it's a case for different reasons, either to grow or to become more efficient operationally from the business perspective, customer, and, and so on. So I'm not a technology expert, but I'm very pleased to be in this environment, which is extremely interesting. And um, I, uh, I think that data is one of the most uh, important and relevant uh, sources of uh, making the customer happier and with an easier life and uh, sources of increasing and developing proper the business uh, for, uh, for the companies. So that's it briefly. And I'm based in Madrid now. <laughs> Thank you, Violeta. Thank you. So next we have Hilary Mason. 
So Hillary G is a GM of machine learning and the founder of Fast Forward Labs. And when Googling Hillary, you'll find out that she was once named the most influential data scientist in New York, or one of. Yeah, very impressive. Thank you. Does this work? Can anyone hear me at all? Yeah. Hello. Great. OK, thank you, Justin. Um, I appreciate the data point. Um, so I'm the general manager of Cloudera's machine learning business, which looks after our CDSW software platform, so Cloudera Data Science Workbench, as well as our Fast Forward Labs Applied Machine Learning Research and Services Group. Um, Fast Forward Labs joined Cloudera about a little over a year and a half ago. I was the founder of that company. I started it almost five years ago to do applied machine learning uh, in the enterprise context to really attempt to invent a new mechanism for applied research to help customers uh, accelerate the pace with which they could actually make use of data science and machine learning technology. Because as we all know, it is changing rapidly. It's very hard to understand the current state of the art, and it's even harder to make it actually work on real data to create real value. I actually started my career as a computer science professor working in machine learning quite a long time ago, um, and then uh, eventually realized academia was not for me. Um, and have been uh, creating companies and working as chief scientist or that sort of role for a very long time. Um, so I'm pretty excited to be having this discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary. Yes. And finally, our last panelist is one of my favorite people at Cloudera, um, X Hortonworks, Anna Jalan, and she is vibrant, outspoken, not shy, and super smart. She's a solution engineer on our EMEA team, <laughs> and I'm really thrilled to have her because she always has something to say, and it's very witty. Anna. Thank you for that. <laughs> No pressure. Um, so my name is yeah, it's Anna Gillen. I'm a solutions engineer at Cloudera, formerly of Hortonworks. Um, I'm basically the technical half of the sales team. I support our customers uh, on their journeys through big data to machine learning, everything like that. Um, so day to day, I'm spending time with customers, um, but also I'm that kind of translation point between engineering and product management and the actual customers' needs. So. Always fun. Um, like Devin, I also did not follow a traditional route into technology. Um, I studied French and German <laughs> at undergrad. So um, I then decided, you know, after doing a couple of jobs which happened to be in tech, um, that I really wanted to know more. So I did a master's in data science and analytics. Um, near where I, I grew up uh, in a town called Egham. Um, <laughs> and um, so, you, uh, so I did that. And basically, the day after I handed in my master's thesis, I started at Hortonworks. So that's been an, <laughs> a really interesting four and a half years. Um, so uh, yeah, basically, right now, I, I specialize kind of in, in making all of this cool tech actually usable by businesses. So you might call me a killjoy, but actually, you know, security and governance are super important, and without them, none of this tech is really usable in enterprises. So um, that's really what I enjoy, and suppose that makes me an interesting person. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Anna. Yeah. So with that, I think we checked the first question, but I did want to follow up on the first question, which was the, make an introduction, how do you get into the area, and what are your area of expertise? So we have kind of an even split between the humanitarian studies and core engineering backgrounds. What do you consider your areas of expertise today? I'll start with Violetta. Thank you. Um, so um, uh, in my area, Maybe I should start from uh, a little bit uh, from things which I did not mention, that uh, I work in the insurance industry for more than 22 years. And I did uh, almost everything. Uh, I did uh, marketing, I did training for the agents, set up networks for distribution, uh, worked in um, operations. Um, I was CEO five times in uh, AXA and in the previous company for which I worked for 14 years. Uh, so, um, of course, next to this, uh, I had to learn finance because of my jobs, yes, and so on. So, um, and right now, perhaps, I never had a very um, easy job in terms of uh, being uh, more routine-like. All my jobs were very much uh, of change, uh, transform the entities, uh, startups, uh, rebuild, build, rebuild. 
turnaround of the companies, and perhaps that's why uh, my expertise of so many years in this area, um, AXA asked me to do this job to help on turnaround the, the different lines of business of companies for different uh, business purposes. So, um, and of course, my very special uh, field and love is insurance because I'm coming also from this part, from the theoretical part, from the academic background until I joined the, the industry and then I think it was a perfect combination of helping my students also with my uh, current uh, practical work and now um, I see a huge difference between uh, 20, 22 years ago, 25 years ago on the industry and what's going on now, especially due to the technology and the sophistication of the markets regulatory changes and everything what you all do here. So that impacts the business models a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody from the panel wants to? Um, you know, I work for a technology company and I spend about 50% of my time talking to our customers. And I think what's really important and a good skill to have and something that I work on myself is being able to translate data concepts into business value, into business outcomes. How do we make it simple? How do we speak data in a way in which others can easily understand, others that may not have the same kind of backgrounds that we do? And I think that's a real art and something that I work on and uh, continue to share with, with my customers. That and another concept of creating data literacy. And so I think that, um, you know, I'm. I'm always trying to help SAP become a data-driven organization. I know that sounds very strategic, but really it means that data is a part of everyone's job, and so I spend a lot of time evangelizing data within our company. Great. Yeah, I think I, I really like that term, data literacy, actually. Um, that's something that I've been thinking about, because like I said, I'm quite still quite new um, to the field. And kind of how can I, knowing that, make the transition easier for other people that are coming in as well? Um, yeah, and I think it's just about thinking, really, how do we make that, that learning easier? And it's a massive field, and there are so many things to know. So how can we kind of break it down? And, and coming from that humanities background, I'd like to think that I bring a different perspective to it. And my boss is sat over there and might kind of disagree. But I think I can kind of bring so kind of the ways I think about problems in those domains into, into the data space as well. Um, so I think there is a lot of crossover. Anybody else on the panel? Thank you. I mean, it, defining a single area of expertise depends a lot on context, right? Because if you were a room full of professor, mm. I, professors here, I'd be talking about my work in resource-bounded reasoning and natural language processing. But um, I think the theme that I've heard emerge here is that this is a domain in which most of us do things today we were never trained to do in school. In fact, many of us come from backgrounds where you never even had the option of learning it in school and the universities are quite far behind where we in this room are. And so uh, I think in terms of, rather than thinking about expertise, think about superpowers or things to practice, which is really learning quickly, oh, communicating clearly. Um, being able to work with a variety of people and understanding that in this space, technology is part of the solution and you must understand that deeply, but it's everything around the technology that you also need to be able to understand and manage. And I say that as a technologist with a business hobby. Um, the business part of it tends to be much more challenging than the technical part. Um, and so if we had to identify any expertise that one might find useful in this field, it's really um, that agility um, and I think also we see in this field people come to it from such diverse backgrounds and that is a superpower um, that makes our team stronger. Um, and when I'm building teams, I deliberately recruit for different perspectives, different backgrounds, because a uh, huge benefit comes out of the fact that in one room you can have people looking at things from very different perspectives. Anna, what is your superpower? <laughs> <laughs> Karaoke. No, um, <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I just agree with absolutely this entire panel. Um, it's so important to, the thing that I'm kind of maniacally focused on really is just, you know, every time people start talking to me about, oh, can we use like this tech? Can we use, what about Spark? Like which version of Spark do you get? It's like, stop talking about the tech actually. What do you want to achieve? And that's literally every time I go into a customer meeting, that's the first thing that I absolutely drill into it. I'm like, I don't care which piece of tech you're using, which version. What do you want to do? 
why do you want to do it? And then work backwards from that. Eventually the tech will come and then you'll make that choice. Um, and it's, it's absolutely what I do all the time. So it's translating, as you say, that business need into the tech finally at the end, but the tech is almost secondary. And it's interesting, completely unrehearsed, we've agreed on the mix golden circle methodology, then ask a question, why first? And technology always follows. So um, next question is, coming from the historical perspective and moving into the presence, uh, present. What are the most exciting, interesting projects you work on currently, and why do you choose to focus on that? And let's start with uh, Devon this time. Thank you. Um, we're, I suppose we're right at the start of our journey into looking at streaming, um, and I know that that's a big topic. I think there's a couple of workshops actually on that at the conference. So. I think that's very exciting. Um, I think going back to what Anna said, it's important to kind of think about the problems that you're trying to solve. Um, traditionally, we've worked in kind of a batch uh, fashion and now trying to come up with new ways of thinking about the problems and seeing what we can leverage there. So I'm, I'm particularly excited about that, actually, I think. And is that something of a passion of yours or you think your, your company is looking at streaming as yeah, absolutely the company. Um, for me, at the moment, I think to the point of not having an area of expertise because it's all new um, and there's lots of stuff to learn. So, yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm very interested in seeing where that goes, I think, and learning more about it. Great. Um, we're embarking on um, an opportunity to include data ethics in everything that we do at SAP. And I'm super psyched about that because of the human element and because it's uh, the concept of data for good is something that we're embracing. And we've created an ethics council, I think one of the first of its kind within our company, but also with other tech leaders. And so I'm proud to be a part of that. I think that's an exciting and very important uh, activity. Um, in our area, one of the most uh, relevant um, directions and strategic direction for the whole group and uh, implicitly also for uh, the area in which we work now, now it's uh, health insurance. And health insurance is, uh, by definition, um, an area in which if you want to improve both uh, towards customers and also to make uh, more efficient all the operations, uh, uh, seamless uh, process, also to avoid uh, everything like like fraud, waste, and abuse, which is quite common in health insurance, we work very much on, on data. So um, I, it's very important that next to the technical part and the business part, it's extremely relevant to create a change management culture in the, in the entities because um, perhaps by default, the human nature is a little bit reluctant to big changes which will be implied by, by data and by the machine learning and the artificial intelligence. And that's one of the key areas in which we are focusing on. But of course, um, AXA is investing a lot in this uh, data, uh, wants to be one of the data-driven companies, and I think that a lot of pro progress has been done so far, even under the auspices and the shareholding of AXA, there have been set up some startups for the innovation, for data innovation, and the best practices and the innovation which is developed there, it's uh, used uh, in, in different entities. And we have already several very, very good examples in this, uh, which also uh, in different countries, uh, first of all in mature markets, but also in the developing uh, and growing markets like in the Gulf, uh, now we are working on a similar project in Singapore, will be further rolled out in other countries, in Turkey as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, next to this, uh, it's not only about the data in in the AXA entity, but it's also about how you integrate with the data in the when we have uh, vertical integrated models, for instance, hospitals with uh, clinics, with uh, different type of insurance providers. And another area which I think is extremely relevant is to reduce, it's, uh, both for the client and for the operational efficiency of the company, is so-called predictive underwriting. So when we have the assessment of the, uh, both for life insurance and for health, we do not need to ask 20, 30 questions like it is an old model, but we store 
three questions you can do underwriting given automatically and, and uh, without going through the many steps and things can be done in a few minutes instead of two weeks. So it will, we increase the value of the business, we increase the customer satisfaction, which will give the opportunity to grow the business and to have, you know, cross-selling and every other opportunities. And, and of course, to be um, much better and much more efficient in this area. So to sum up, health insurance, uh, it's one of the most relevant projects on which we work. And data has a primordial role in this in order to make it successful. And so far, we can see good results. That's fascinating. Um, so I'm going to list three, and I'm going to do them really quickly. The first one is a personal project that I'm revisiting from some years ago, where I crawled about 5,000 recipes for chocolate chip cookies off the web. And I've been building statistical models of the best chocolate chip cookie recipe. And so. You can put in like chewy and it'll pull up the you know ingredient amounts and uh, new ingredients you might add if you wanted to create that. Um, the reason I'm revisiting that though is so that I can actually try and implement it on uh, all of the tooling in the market so I can get a really good uh, you know empathetic understanding of the current challenges, which leads me to my professional uh, project I'm very excited about, which is that, um, well, let me ask, how many people here are data scientists or analysts or people who are doing that work on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, okay, so some of you. And do you think the tools that you use today are the tools you will be using in five years? No, okay, so that's the project I'm most excited about right now, which is really to think about the areas of our workflows that are inefficient, that cause more damage than they give us value, um, that uh, keep us from collaborating with our peers effectively, that um, you know, are stuck in potentially older models of feature engineering than are uh, necessarily what we need for the approaches we want to take, that don't help enforce any rigor around testing or bias testing or interpretability in the, the data science artifacts we're producing, and really thinking about as our industry and our field converges on some kind of workflow, and I know it will happen, because right now if you are a data scientist at one company and you go to another company, your job is different, your tools are different, you sit in a different place in the org, you might be expected to know different things, maybe you need a PhD, maybe you don't, nobody really knows. Um, all of that will, will be figured out. Um, and you know, here at Cloudera and the machine learning business, we have a point of view on trying to figure that out to serve our customers. So helping folks like your team implement uh, better insurance underwriting. Um, and so that's the that's the very high level thing I'm I'm very excited about. And then there's a third one that falls out of that, which is while we study and attempt to evolve the practice of our field. Um, and I've been doing this work for a long time, and I've seen it change dramatically in the last 10 years. Uh, we have an opportunity to help people do it better. Um, and so in our Fast Forward Labs work, we've written about ethics and bias in machine learning for the last five years in every report we've ever done. Um, I believe that should be part of our practice. I wrote a book on this topic last year. Um, and so that's another project that is adjacent to my professional work at Cloudera, but related. Because as we in this room, in this community, define what our work is going to look like and then build the tooling and software to support that, um, we have a chance to really do it right. That's quite hard to follow. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the nature of my work really is actually enabling other people to do cool projects um, because obviously I'm working with organizations from every possible industry sector um, and they're all doing what you guys are doing. So this is like really amazing for me to to actually see what can be achieved using technology. Um, I'll give an example and actually um, that customer of mine is speaking tomorrow in the Expo Theatre at 1pm. They're called Babylon Health. Um, and if you're in the UK, you will have seen adverts for them on the tube. Um, and they are providing um, um, video conference um, doctor's appointments. Um, so that you don't have to like, you know, we have a big like problem in our national health service where like you can never get a doctor's appointment and it's just horrible. Um, but now you can register for that and you can just see someone basically on an app. Um, and they're doing lots of stuff on um, machine learning to create decision support for doctors. 
for clinicians. So, and, and that's one of the, like, it's slightly bleeding into, you know, later things we might talk about, but one of the really exciting trends that I'm particularly excited about is around, like, augmented intelligence as opposed to artificial intelligence, where um, these algorithms are being used to give a series of suggestions to actual humans, which are, you know, you know, the machine will come up with these really quickly, and then the human will use their human judgment and experience to pick one of the best ones. And I find that super exciting, because I know like, people are super scared of like, all the ethics of letting the machines take control, and how do we know that there's like, uh, you know, is the machine biased? You know, uh, what biases are we giving it by using you know, training data that is implicitly, you know, we don't, we don't even know what biases are within the training data that we're giving it. So you giving the human some control over what is actually being chosen is super exciting. So these kind of decision support systems are some of the systems that I'm really interested in you know, when my customers are, are dealing with them. Um, so yeah, you can hear Babylon Health talk tomorrow um, if you're interested in that as well. And, and both Hillary and Anna will kind of segue in into my next question because we've looked at the past, we've looked at today, but what we want to hear from our panel, what are their thoughts on the biggest trends that will be dominant in our industry? And as well as what are the things that will fizzle out? What is hot today that mm -hmm. may not be relevant or very hot tomorrow? And I want to start with, um, well, actually, whoever wants to go first. You have it, okay. Because I, I already started on the mm -hmm. augmented bit. But so the, the augmented intelligence is kind of the main trend that I'm really excited about. Because um, I think we need to stop being obsessed with artificial intelligence. It's, we're not going to get there. Um, and also just this so much consideration around that. Um, but the, the other one is around kind of democratization of data. Um, and kind of what I mean with that is that not just in businesses where you know we have these data lakes or we have you know whatever where everyone can have access to any report that they want, um, which is most of what I do day to day, but actually as a consumer, it's super exciting for me because I have access to, I, and I'm starting to get access to all the data that you know my bank has about me, that you know all insurers have about me, so that I have full control and I actually can make decisions in my life based on that. Um, so you know, uh, one of my customers has a analytics app. Um, uh, on the bank, and they're actually my bank as well. So you download the app, and it gives you like a breakdown summary of like where you've spent your money. Um, and I don't really look at it because it scares me. But <laughs> but you know, actually, you know, it's you know, if I were less of a coward, I would look at it and go, okay, maybe I should stop buying coffee, um, and just buy you know a cafetiere and make it myself because <laughs> I'm spending hundreds of pounds on coffees. Um, so you know, these kind of Decision support also for the consumer, you know, for the individual, as well as for the business. And I think that that's, that's, that's one trend I'm massively excited about um, in terms of, like, data usage. In, in terms of what's fizzling out, um, I mainly thought about, in terms of actual tech, anything that is kind of static. Like, the, the theme for this whole conference, this is, is around cloud and agility, etc. And I think just fixed, monolithic, computer systems, things that don't change. You're talking about change management earlier. You know, it's like businesses need to be agile and reactive. And I think that because of the changing needs of the consumer, because of the world, you know, next week I might not be part of the Europe anymore. And I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, the business oh, and Anna I need to... does live in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I need to adapt to that. And so does a business, right? Um, and so everything that's kind of static, immovable, takes six months to make changes to, that cannot be the reality anymore. So I think s static computer systems are definitely going away. Um, and that's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. <laughs> Anybody else want to take a try? I mean, we can just head down. I'll yep. be very, mm -hmm. very brief and just say I agree completely with what you said about the overemphasis on artificial intelligence and not enough emphasis on providing information to people to make better decisions. 
Um, and we, I think that is one thing that we'll see fizzle out in the next year, sort of the hype around AI and what will be left behind will be hopefully the people who are actually creating real value out of the technology. And hopefully we can uh, have that discussion without having to say, no, we're not talking about literal robots that will have conversations with you. Now that said, um, on the technical side of the world, I'm still very excited about um, progress and being able to extract value out of unstructured data. So the majority of analysis our customers do today is primarily unstructured data, and we have made a ton of progress in using text and images and audio and video. Um, but there is so much more value there that we have not yet um, been able to completely utilize in an easy way. And there is a, a huge amount of progress in areas like transfer learning and NLP in order uh, to be able to actually provide and find that structure and unstructured data so we can benefit from it. As to things that will fizzle out, I think Hadoop will fizzle out. Not that it will go away, of course, but that the people who are doing the work uh, close to the business problems should not have to worry about it anymore. The people who worry about it will be a little bit further down in the stack, and you're all wonderful people. Um, but those of us who are thinking more about um, the business value, uh, we should not have to care about that anymore. Thank you. Um, first of all, I think that all the companies will have to invest in data and the machine learning and artificial intelligence, augmented intelligence, because at one moment, uh, the, the moment is not far from now, uh, it will not be a matter of nice to have, it will be a matter of need to have in order to sustain on the market and to, to, to grow further. Uh, that will um, uh, that would be, in my view, one of the, the first trends. Everybody, all the companies will become your clients, most of them. So I think that we'll have to make big investments in this area. Secondly, I think that um, a lot of um, jobs which currently exist will not exist, and the new ones will appear. So that means that um, also the companies in every industry has to review the business model and uh, to, with all the consequences of this, and to accept that also the client is changing very quickly, not only in terms of mentality and the impact of technology on our daily life, but the new generation who will come, who are children who are born with a tablet and with a mobile device, will be the clients of tomorrow and will not want to do the business as it is done currently. So it means a new, a new way of looking at the business, a new looking of and serving the client, new, a new type of uh, new jobs, new profiles, new, new skills which are uh, represented uh, or are needed, and also new type of leaders who understand that uh, the world of today and especially the world of tomorrow will be a very dynamic one, much more dynamic than now, and every uh, and we cannot live uh, in in the. Um, idea that things uh, will not change or will change very, very slowly. That's not the case anymore. And with the globalization and with everything uh, that happens in the world, I mean, there are different trends which we all know and uh, hear on the news every day. I think that will also have an impact on the way in which the business will be done. And um, uh, not to forget the, the um, uh, again, change management and also the simplicity which we have to bring in our business and to eliminate every complexity which currently exists also because of the way of working, because of legacy of the systems. But now I think that all the technology trends which are going uh, currently and will continue will help in this respect. But we need to understand that we have to change from inside and the mentality and the way in which you look to the business for the future. And what do you think will fizzle out? What do you think won't be relevant? What do you think won't be relevant? What will go away. What jobs will go away? Or what, what kind of trends? What, trends? what, what kind of uh, things overhyped today that will go away? Um, I think that the manual work, uh, which exists unfortunately a lot in, in many industries, uh, um, things are like, uh, you know, um, um, call centers uh, in a classical uh, meaning, yes, uh, uh, answering uh, the calls uh, uh, to answer, answer different questions which will be possible to be answered by machine, uh, not anymore uh, eight hours per day, but 24 uh, by seven. Um, 
I don't know, may, maybe more, I have to think, but I, I think that they will come as a consequence quite easily and directly considering the, all the developments. And one thing, thank you, um, that uh, the classical industries will find competitors from outside their industries. Mm. And for instance, in our area, it's quite obvious, Google, Amazon, other companies are trying to come with insurance products on a different channel with less investment, with less infrastructure, with less people, because they take a leapfrog on this technology development and um, artificial intelligence and all this, what we have been discussing, and they will be capable to compete quite, uh, quite uh, strongly the, the classical industry. That's why everybody has to adjust to what is going to happen. And that uh, it's important to not to stay too long time to think and to make philosophy. You have to move it fast, yeah? Thank you. Oh, it's all great. Some really good ideas here. Um, I would just like to say that I do hope that what changes for the good is more diversity and inclusion. So I have to kind of wave that flag a bit. Uh, I, I think that we will all benefit from more diverse teams. I think that is a huge trend, and we have some strong goals uh, in order to see that change happen and are doing everything that we can to drive that change as well. Um, from a technical perspective, what I hear a lot from companies is the challenge of what data do I need and what data don't I need? And I think there's this uh, shift in paradigm of less is more, more is less. By that I mean we need a lot of volume of data to be more intelligent, to make more better decisions and to be informed with insightful knowledge and information that comes from structured, unstructured, et cetera. Then there's the challenge of, is, is there some creepiness there going on? Do I have too much data? Am I taking away some of the power from the person? And I think companies struggle with that. They struggle with, you know, I, I want to protect, I want to ensure privacy, I want to be ethical, but at the same time, I need a lot of content and information. So there's a, a dichotomy going on that I think is uh, struggling with executives. Yeah, and, and speaks to your uh, to your data ethics initiative. At the yeah, SAP. I mean, I think mm -hmm. it's at the at the forefront, and I think that uh, senior executives right now are fearful of risk, and they they're not educated or informed on what the capabilities are and what they need, and they rely on all of us to educate them in a way that's simple and meaningful, um, but they also know that they need to to make change, and mm -hmm. I think that's just making that leap and uh, and doing so in a way that's. Uh, that that preserves their uh, their ability to, to handle risk. And, no, thank uh, you for yeah. providing this context because I was thinking what that data ethics means a lot of things for many people. But thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, sure. yeah. And Devon, I think I, again I like that term democratizing access to data science. I think from my point of view, I think of it in terms of the skills that people need. So I've heard this term um, citizen data scientist, for example. Um, and the idea being that you can get quite far with only very basic skills, whether that's you know, knowing how to write a bit of code or um, using BI tools or whatever it is that you have. But you don't necessarily have to be that data scientist with the PhD to kind of make the difference. So I think we will see kind of a proliferation of people having data in their title where previously they weren't kind of data focused jobs, um, purely because everyone has to have that, that data literacy again, back to that one. Um, and I certainly hope that happens. I think that's kind of key to hitting that, those diversity goals as well, kind of broadening our access. Um, and I think I'd have to agree in terms of what fizzles out, hopefully some of the jargon um, again, because <laughs> it's just unhelpful. And I think often it is. It's, it's very confusing, yeah? Like it's, everybody it's claims to do AI. Well, exactly. You have, to be, you have to be lazy not to have it on your website. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, unfortunately. And I think that does obscure a lot more um, than it kind of helps. So. Yeah, I hope some of that will go away and kind of we'll, we'll refocus on the foundational stuff. Um, so that, yeah, let's see. Thanks. So I want to switch gears a little bit and ask the audience if they have any questions for panelists. And if you do, please come up to, well, do we have a microphone for the audience? Has everybody heard the question? Do I need to repeat it? Yes, okay. So the first question was about 
policy making. And the second question was about using data science for to fight bullying online online issues. Um, anybody wants to take a stab at it? Hi, so in a previous life, I was the chief scientist at a company called Bitly, which is a social media oh, analytics you. platform. That was a long, long time ago. Um, so uh, for reasons completely unconnected to me being here, I'm quite familiar with social media data analysis and continue to participate actively in that community. And unfortunately, the reality of the situation is that the companies are unwilling to have a public uh, statement other than the PR-friendly one. However, there are people inside of those companies who are working against their own business interests, in many cases uh, dealing with internal politics to attempt to remediate some of the issues. On the academic side, there's a very large community that is critical, so that is doing an analysis that is in many cases saying, you know, Facebook is doing it wrong, and they are, um, and producing reports and information about that. But those folks are also not empowered to actually have an impact in what those companies do. And so unfortunately, the situation today is pretty dire. Um, and it's one in, in where you have a few sort of free actors. So there are some nonprofits who are doing work to sort of, in the back channel, bridge into those companies while helping people in their individual cases. Um, but I do think that if we are going to see any progress here, it's likely going to come out of a regulatory framework or at least a legal framework which holds those companies liable for the abuse that women and others suffer on those platforms. And I think that that's quite interesting as well, as well with the first question, quite a nice link because, um, and also a link to some of the stuff we've been speaking about because the data literacy needs to go up even to the highest levels because I think, you know, I'm now linking back to, for example, Brexit. The <laughs> it's, it's just on my mind. Um, you know, people were misled by statistics and it's like, and you know, okay, yes, we have access to data and we have access to all of this information, but the data literacy is so important because actually people don't understand how to interpret statistics and what percentages mean and, and what, uh, you know, confidence levels are and, and all of these kinds of things. And that goes as well for the government, right? So, you know, they're being presented with, with stats, um, not interpreted or interpreted with a bias, for example. Um, and that's the same thing with, with you know, companies like uh, Twitter and Facebook. I'm sure statistics can be interpreted such that it reveals there's no problem. Um, mm. And you know, it, it almost feels like you're kind of screaming into the void sometimes, with, you know, going all of these women, all of these people of color, all of these you know, religious groups are being persecuted online and they're going, I can't see anything wrong. And you know, so it's kind of it's a mix between anecdotal evidence, mix between statistics supporting that with the, the with the data, um, and that's something like we haven't worked out yet. And I, I don't know what's the answer, but it is definitely something I'm super passionate about as well. Like you know, you, <laughs> we're online, we're watching this happen. And do you think it's something that the government should step up to solve, or it should be solved at resp in responsibility of everybody in the room? Both, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, for me it's both because the government can legislate, but at the same time you can't change mindsets. Um, and it's such like a cultural fabric to overlook things um, and to sort of paper over issues. And if you're not experiencing something, it's almost like it's not real. Um, and yeah, so the government can legislate things, but at the same time, you know, there's ethical issues of like free speech and, uh, you know, do, are we impacting that? And, you know, it's like, it's, it's hard. <laughs> Um, I was just going to say to that point, to your second question, I read a really interesting article the other day, and it was a lady who was a moderator um, for various kind of social media platforms. And one of the things she said that hit me was that we have um, machines that kind of root, I suppose, the, the problematic comments and things to her. But she said, you know, at the end of the day, it's still a human that has to sit there and decide, is it, is it right or wrong? And I think it kind of does show the limit almost of just relying on kind of models and data, because at the end of the day, like you say, it's a cultural problem. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, humans are always more complex than, than the machines. So, yeah, definitely I don't think it's something we've sold, but it's a very interesting one. It's a great question. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? If I may. So, 
when you go outside the room, unfortunately, uh, it's not as balanced as within this room. So being practical, going, I don't know, five, ten years from now, what can we do in order to make it more balanced, uh, the crowd that uh, is hosted in this conference today? Are you talking about gender-specific issues? Or? Diversity in general, but yes. Diversity in general. Yeah, diversity doesn't have to be gender-specific, but diversity from different cultural backgrounds, geographies, um, educations, and so on. So the question is, what can we do to address it when we go outside of these doors? That's a great question. Thank you. No, go ahead. Yeah, I was just, just going to say kind of back to what I said earlier, in that I think um, widening out access to the skills that you need to participate in the field is quite important. Um, we've kind of been looking at, at recruitment, and I think that that's obviously a big part of it. But having to go out to where those people are, rather than expecting them to come to you, because it's, it's that thing of if you keep doing the same thing you've always done, you'll always get the same result. So I think you do have to yeah, identify kind of the communities or wherever it is that those people are and go out to them and kind of engage them in the conversation. Anybody else? I, mean, I could talk for you know, an hour on this once. Go ahead. Not for an hour, but... Um. <laughs> yeah, sure. I would just say, um, you know, get involved. So I would ask everybody in this room as a takeaway to think about how you can drive change within your organizations, uh, within your communities. There's a big issue with young people today and how they are developed in terms of various types of opportunities. There's gender bias there in our education systems all over the globe, and so there's an opportunity there to drive change. Um, it's certainly at the executive level, so if you don't have diversity and inclusion programs in your organizations, start one. Um, when women in big data, I know we are focused uh, specifically on bringing in more diversity of women into the careers of big data, but one of our priorities this year is looking at men and looking at the attitudes there that are preventing hiring decisions from being more diverse and, uh, and building up more teams that are inclusive and what are the mindset changes that we need to make there. So I think you know, lots of ways in which, uh, which you can get involved. Just, I would say, go out and, uh, and take a stand and don't be shy. And by your coming here, by the way, by seeing such a great diverse audience at this event just warms my heart. Mine too. Yeah, right? I'm Not to be put off by the you know, title, this is a women in big data lunch. It's for everybody, right? You know, uh, coming from the business uh, directly, we measure everything. So you, if you don't measure, you don't manage. So most of the listed companies have also a KPI in terms of diversity, which is part of the corporate social responsibility. So if things do not happen naturally, and if there is not enough uh, openness to this insight, you have to do it from this point of view. And I don't know uh, how much uh, you know about this in general, but uh, the first country who came with uh, as a national policy in terms of gender diversity in the non-executive boards uh, was Norway who put a quota of 40%, and it has been a lot of debate about shall we put quota or not, because it can be, you know, it's offending for the woman, and so on and so forth. At the end, it was uh, the, the penalty for the company who did not meet it in a certain uh, time frame that uh, was uh, delisting from the, uh, from the stock market, which could not be anything worse, yeah? It was a, uh, let's say, a kind of tough uh, measure, tough legislation, but it worked. And some other companies or governments, uh, I mean, took some example out of it, how to make it work, because the only, if you only say, please do it, people will not do it. Yeah? So it's important to measure and to reward or the opposite. Yeah? So I think that, first of all, in the nicest and idealistic way, this should not happen, and it comes from within, from inside. But in reality, if it doesn't work, you have to do something to work, because it was proven by any research that a diverse environment gets better results, better for the customer, better understanding of the customer, better uh, return on equity, better um, underlying earnings profits, however we want to call them, better revenues, and so on and so forth. So I think it's first of all up to us, 
And I'm sure that uh, the new generation which comes is much more open to this. And uh, we need to have this cultural shift as well because it's always a matter of mentality and culture. If we want to make it, we can make it. And I think if we want to have a change, that change has to start with us, with you, with me, with everybody, like uh, Gandhi said, you know? Yeah. I Thank agree you. with that. That's um, great. I just want to add, for the people in this room, there are very specific things you can do to help, not so much on the necessarily the diversity side, but on the inclusion side. Because the truth is that we retain diverse talent at a much lower rate, and I mean we broadly, um, than, we, uh, than we should. And there are things you can do. So talk to your peers, find out what their salaries are. If you're a man, tell the women you work with what you make. Make sure that they can ask for what you make. Um, when you see opportunities that you're asked to participate in that you can't participate in, invite a diverse person to take your place. Um, there are, you might think, you know, I'm just a data analyst, I'm not in a position where I can have an impact, but you can advocate for the people in your organization who are diverse from your perspective, um, whether that be racially or age or gender. Um, and there are these very specific things you can do. And then also, especially for the men in the room, ask the question of your leadership about diversity. Um, because coming from you, it looks a little bit less self-interested and you can do that without uh, damage. Um, and make sure that they know that people in their teams care about this. Um, and those are things you can do when you walk out of here today. That's great, thank you, Kilroy. Everything above. That's what you get for sitting on the end. No, exactly. Yeah, I mean, everything's basically been said. It's just, you know, just do your work. It's, you know, and, you know, if you are, consider yourself to be a minority, I don't know, just find other people who are like you because we all exist, right? You, you've seen, you know, the diversity of this panel in this room. Uh, there are supporters. You know, if you feel like you, you know, find a mentor or find someone who can guide you through it, it doesn't have to be the same gender or the same, you know, anything as you. Um, just, yeah, be a professional who happens to be a woman or a person of color or anything. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and that you'll then end up being an example for other people uh, who are like you. So I think that's, that's the best we can do, really, and everything that they also said. <laughs> I just want to add one more thing. I think that... Um, um, if we take gender diversity or whatever criteria we want, I think it's important for the so-called minority, which should not exist anymore, should be everybody equal, should not have any complex or frustration or bad feeling because this is obvious. And once you, you feel somehow uh, bad or lower, then you show it in your behavior. You then show you it in, mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in the way... Uh, so you impose a different, uh, specific treatment and behavior from the counterpart, which should not exist. Um, I, I'm coming from, um, uh, from Romania, I'm Romanian. So in my country and in Central European countries, all the women during the communist time were um, working. So it was part of the regime. I mean, it didn't exist. The first time when I heard, I heard and, and this diversity and uh, inclusion did not exist as a concept in those countries. Okay, we are talking about 30 years ago because the communism, as you know, fell in 89. But uh, I had a chance afterwards while I was working in the university to go for, um, <clears throat> to a Harvard Business School to a program for management development, which was in 94. And that was the place where I heard this first time. And I was totally shocked. I could not understand. Though very few women, we were 120 participants, and we were like eight or, se or, ni uh, eight or nine women. And they were so frustrated and so unhappy, and I could not understand why. And I asked them, what are you talking about? And they told the stories which we can, can hear also today. And they asked me, so you don't have this problem? I said, I never felt it. And if somebody has a problem, it's his problem and not mine. Because if we accept this is a problem and we talk too much about it, it becomes a bigger problem. And on the other hand, and if I still have two minutes, it's something, um, I have two sons. Yes, one is 27, one is 24. When they were younger uh, and they started with girls and girlfriends, so I told them, look, you will never make a girl suffer. If I hear this, you will have a big problem with me. 
And the young one, when he was 16 or 17, he had a girlfriend. And after, you know, at that age, it doesn't take too long to stop. So he suffered a lot because she left him. I think you'd be angry if I tell the story. So don't <laughs> keep it. <laughs> and, and he was telling, Mommy, you know that she left and she told me whatever. I don't go in details. And I said, you know, come on. She doesn't disturb you, deserve you. But let you will see that she will come back, which actually happened. But he said no. And I said, you have to keep your pride and your integrity, but never make a girl suffer. And the first three days, he was suffering like hell, crying. Uh, we were uh, text messages that didn't exist, WhatsApp that time, uh, to see how he's doing at school. He was, I cannot concentrate. And I said, and, uh, and then when he came home, he told me, you know, you don't, you care about the girls, but about your children, you don't care at all. What kind of heart have you as a mother? So I said, never offend a girl, a woman in your life. So it's also a matter, I think, how we, we tell them at home, both for girls to be, to stand up and to be strong and also for the boys to, to treat them equally. So in my case, it worked with my boys, so I'm happy so far. <laughs> that will never happen different because you have a problem with me. Uh, I, I'm from Russia. A lot of these things I've heard from my parents, too. <laughs> There's similarity in upbringing. Well, we are at the end of our time. I do want to give you guys an opportunity to introduce yourself to the speaker, grab a t-shirt, and kind of in conclusion, and this is where my key takeaways, I think being in our technology, whether you're man or woman, any background, ethnicity, or... Um, education is challenging. But I think this challenge comes with a lot of opportunity. And as a panel today, discuss the past and present and the future of, of technology and the industries that they're working in, I think there is a reason we all choose to be part of this industry. It's exciting. You get exposed to amazing stuff. It comes with challenges. Deal with this. <laughs> but um, thank you so much for coming. I want to thank our panelists. This has been beyond um, any dreams to have standing room only. We have to add people, we have to add tables. So thank you so much for coming in, taking time um, out of your day and not attending other sessions. Until DC. Yes, thank you again.